There is a lot of misinformation and half-truths out there regarding Kamen Rider Hibiki. It was never meant to be a Kamen Rider series, the script was rewritten on the final day, kids found the Oni scary, and a ton of other things. Today we're going to journey through the show's messy production cycle, learning about the people who made the show, what led to things changing, and trying to clear up as many myths as possible. I won't talk too much about my feelings regarding the show, mostly because we'd be here for a hot minute. Hibiki was the second writer show I ever saw way back in 2005 when it was airing. I was 16 at the time and it landed right when I needed it to, so it's a little difficult for me to be super objective when talking about the story. Now before we get into it, there are three big names you need to know. There's Shigenori Takatera, Shinichiro Shirakura, and Toshiki Inoue. Takatera was the show's producer, but he was also the producer of Kamen Rider Kuga, the series that relaunched the Kamen Rider franchise and is responsible for its sort of more dramatic take. By the time Kuga rolled around, Takatera had already worked with Toei for a while. He produced some pretty big hits for Sentai including Car Ranger and Ginga Man before working on Kamen Rider Kuga. Shida Kuda is one of the most prolific producers at Toei, serving as chief producer on about six and a half of the first ten Heisei Kamen Rider shows, and we'll get to that half a little later on. Finally, Toshiki Inoue, he was the head writer on Jetman, Agito, Fize, Kiva, and the second half of Hibiki. Again, we'll get to that second half later on. Shigenori Takatera was given the role of chief producer on the 2005 series way back in February of 2004, just after Kamen Rider Blade began its broadcast. Now, I say the 2005 series and not Hibiki because at that time, there was going to be no Kamen Rider series in 2005. And this is where one of the biggest mistruths regarding Hibiki comes from. So the easiest way to put it is like this. Even though the series that aired at 8am in 2005 wasn't always going to be a Kamen Rider show, Hibiki itself was always meant to be one. By the time production on the show began, Takatara hadn't worked on a Kamen Rider series since Kuga, way back in 2000. He said he felt pretty disconnected from what Kamen Rider had become, primarily regarding its use of battle royale style writer vs writer fights. During the planning phase, Takatara wanted to do a remake of the 1972 Shotaro Ishinomori Tokusatsu series Henshin Ninja Arashi, a period piece tokusatsu hero set in feudal Japan. Takatara says one of the reasons for this was to change up the way the action was done in the series and to present a different design style than the sort of armored look that had become the norm for Kamen Rider by this point. The series would have been heavily inspired by a live action anime hybrid commercial series from the early 2000s featuring the boy band SMAP. The general idea for this proposed Arashi remake centered around ninja returning to Japan from all over the world to fight monsters. There were even plans to film the opening sequence in New Zealand, something that later happened with bits of Maho Sentai Maji Rangers opening. Takatara liked the idea of multiple heroes involved in the show, which was one of the reasons he wanted to introduce a ton of ninja. He even pitched the idea of a Toei Hero World subseries, of which Arashi would have been the first entry. Takatara wanted to see other Ishinomori heroes other than just Kamen Rider brought to life for a new generation. This idea sort of survives into Hibiki itself as we see a ton of Oni Riders all over the place. Oh right, so Oni Riders is a term we need to get into. By this point, Kamen Rider shows didn't really like using the term Kamen Rider. The Riders in Hibiki were called Oni Riders, and although some people might see this as justification for saying they're not Kamen Riders, to me, it's sort of just a throwback to the naming scheme from the earlier Kamen Rider shows. Kamen Rider X was called X Rider, Amazon was called Amazon Rider. Being an Ishinomori fan, these are things Takatera probably would have been aware of. As production continued, Toei found out that Justy Riser, the then unnamed follow-up to Toho's Grand Caesar series, would feature ninja heroes. They backed off the idea to avoid direct competition and conflict with Justy Riser. At this point, Arashi becomes focused more on magic than ninjutsu, and once April arrives, Bandai officially approves of doing Henshin Ninja Arashi for 2005. However, when June rolled around, so did Bandai with a request. This new show needed to be Kamen Rider. See, here's the thing with tokusatsu. While these days it's fairly common to have Rider, Sentai, Ultraman, and occasionally Garo on the air, the early 2000s was the second golden era for the medium. 2005 was a crazy busy year with no less than 7 tokusatsu hero shows set for broadcast at the same time. Point is, the field was going to be pretty crowded in 2005, and Bandai didn't want Kamen Rider to fade into the background. After Bandai came to Takatera and his team, asking for the show to be a Kamen Rider, they found course correcting their non-Kamen Rider show into a Kamen Rider one to be kind of difficult. One of the issues involved Hibiki himself not riding a motorcycle for a large part of the show. It was thought that it'd be weird for a hero who fights with harmonious sounds to use something that makes so much noise. One of the elements throughout most Rider shows is that the heroes themselves come from the same technology or origin as their enemies. This goes back to the very first Rider series with Hongo Takeshi, the original Kamen Rider, originally designed to be a warrior for Shocker, the enemy organization in the series. Takatera eventually realized he couldn't do this with his new show, and by August concluded that the Oni and Makamo would be of different origin, though each was still technically a naturally occurring life form. By the time he knew 2005's show had to be a Kamen Rider, 
Takatera decided against making something like Kuga, which he described as stable heroes in an unstable world. Instead, he went with unstable heroes in a stable world. This idea comes to life in the master and apprentice relationship, following the not an adult but not a kid emotion surging through the younger characters in the show. The stable world idea came from the fact that there weren't really conflicts between the heroes. The Oni got along with each other, worked for a stable organization, and were all around friendly and supportive of one another. When bringing some of these ideas to life, there were two elements that the staff drew inspiration from. Yin and Yang, the idea that if Makamo, the demons within the show, exist, so too must the Oni. This was a way of tying the element of evil with the element of good without making them come from the same origin. The second source of inspiration was Shugendo, a religion that's sort of a fusion of various things. It focuses on the worship of the mountains and being more aware of the world around you. Other elements of inspiration came from romance or adventurous fiction, tales of going off on a journey and finding yourself. This was also the first show to feature an entirely instrumental opening theme and the first since Kuga to feature a traditional ending sequence. There were also other artistic touches added to set the show apart. Interspersed throughout the episodes in the first half of the series were title cards that featured bits of kanji relevant to whatever was going on. The logo also took a decidedly more traditional look. Hibiki's logo is the first and so far only writer logo to be read in the traditional right-to-left vertical Japanese style. It also featured Hibiki's name in a sprawling calligraphy style. We finally get to the premiere of the show. The writing team of Suyo Shikida and Shinji Oishi penned many of the episodes together, and it gets... mixed reaction. By this point, Takatera was set on making what he called the Amazon of the Heisei era, Amazon being one of the more unique entries into the Kamen Rider series. This from the onset did not unite viewers. It'd be a lie to say that Hibiki was a total failure. It had a strong fan base. it was just the wrong kind of fan base. Although the show was unpopular with the core audience of kids, it was surprisingly popular with 30-50 to 50 year old males, specifically 30-50 to 50 year old dads. This wasn't enough to save the show though. To this day, Hibiki is still the worst commercially performing series in the Heisei era. During the first half of the series, Hibiki also filmed a ton of scenes out in the mountains. Again, here's that Shugendo influence. Monsters appeared in the mountains and farms and heroes went out to beat them before they could make it to the cities. This led to some fantastic location shots featuring areas we've never seen before. These mountain locations were also far and kind of out of the way from their normal filming locations. It was also expensive to get there. This led to filming getting behind schedule on numerous occasions. Although Toei never gave an official reasoning for why Takatera and his writers were let go, it's been theorized that this falling behind schedule was likely the main reason. So here's where Shirakura comes in. He's got an odd relationship with the show at this point. He saw it as the grand culmination of Takatera's worldview and didn't really want to mess with that at first. But then things changed when he brought on Toshiki Inoue. Initially, Shirakura and Inoue worked together to keep the world of Hibiki intact, but when Shirakura saw that scripts Inoue was turning in were mostly repetitions of what had already been done, he said, Inoue is doing what he wants, and I'm okay with that. Inoue wasn't a fan of the lessons being taught to kids in the audience being so general, so he decided to tear apart one of the central themes in the show, that being the master and apprentice relationship between Hibiki and Asumu. To this end, he introduced the character of Kyosuke Kiriya. Kiriya was a highly contentious character in the show, and I don't think calling him one of the most unpopular characters in the entire franchise would be much of a stretch. He's introduced as Asumu's rival for Hibiki's attention. He's a kid who lost his own father and is now trying to become an oni himself. He's kind of annoying. He one-ups Asumu at everything, almost effortlessly, but he's very arrogant about it all. He's not at all like any character we've seen before in this show. While all of this is going on, Asumu ends up discovering his true passion of... being a doctor? Up to this point in the series, Asumu had two passions music and becoming an oni. The show features other changes in the second half like the oni no longer blowing fire, getting rid of their claws, severely cutting back on mountain filming, getting rid of the kanji title cards, limiting the use of complicated, costly, and time-consuming makamo, and a bunch of other things. Hibiki went from a traditional slice-of-life story following things like an oni's training and their work shifts to an action-oriented focus on the battles themselves. Takatera was later quoted as having said he was unable to really understand what was going on in the second half. The second half of the show also featured Hibiki's final power-up. This was a more traditional looking, heavily armored form. Tsuyoshi no Naka, who designed most of the show's heroes, initially wanted to follow the pattern set forth by Hibiki's second form, Hibiki Crimson. Nonaka liked the idea of subtractive modeling, or becoming stronger by casting something off. Several proposed forms involved color changes for Hibiki, adding unique patterns to his body, and even the removal of the silver metallic parts of his chest. 
It was eventually concluded that this might be a little too confusing for kids in the audience. The final episode of the show is somewhat of a mess. The penultimate episode's climax sees our heroes in a massive battle against hundreds of enemies, to which the final episode follows up on by immediately jumping ahead one year into the future and completely skipping the battle altogether. By this point in time, Asumu and Hibiki have become pretty strange from each other. However, over the course of this episode, they reconnect and Hibiki decides that Asumu can still be his apprentice, even if he's not entirely following in his footsteps. There was a key line in this conversation that needed to be rewritten on location during filming because the cast were not happy with the way it was originally written. And this is where the half-truth of the script being entirely rewritten on the final day comes from. Hibiki's line to Asumu was originally, Mo, ore no soba ni itte mo daijobu da na, which is sort of a frustrated, annoyed way of saying, look, it's okay if you want to be by my side. This line was rewritten to be, ore kara mo ore ni suite koi, which is more like, hey, come on, be by my side. There was a bit of a imperative but not frustrated tone in that second rendition. In the end, the reunion between Asumu and Hibiki was rushed along to fit into the final episode, leading to some heavy criticism online from viewers and industry professionals alike. Shigeki Hosokawa, who played Hibiki, would later say, Hibiki and Asumu growing apart is a bad ending and it's not something I can support. While noted Toei producer Masamichi Sachida, who worked on Decker Ranger, would cite the 1953 Audrey Hepburn movie, Roman Holiday, saying, There are still things you can love about it, even if you know it's not destined to work out. Coupled with production delays, Toei really had no choice but to remove Hibiki's staff. Looking a few years down the line shows some interesting reactions to this decision from key staff members. Tsuyoshi Kida, who comes from the world of theater production, would later go on to write a few Kamen Rider stage shows before being made the head writer of Kamen Rider Wizard, while his Hibiki writing partner Shinji Oshi has not written any superhero media since. For all the good Takatera did for Toei with shows like Car Ranger and Kuga, Hibiki was the burned bridge between the two. Takatera himself has not worked on a Toei production since being removed from Kamen Rider Hibiki. Toei was probably looking for another Kuga, a show so different from what had been done before that people fell in love with the characters, while Bandai probably wanted a toy line that kids would snap up. The reality was a mixed bag of results that nobody was entirely happy with, but viewers can't seem to forget. In the end, Hibiki was something of a failed project, but it also helped revive interest in the franchise. Blade had seen then record low toy sales and ratings for the Heisei era, which continued into Hibiki. However, after the staff change, ratings began to rise and talk of the series online increased as people speculated over what would be done next and what sort of ending the show was heading towards. While Hibiki did find something of a strong audience, it wasn't necessarily the audience that was being hoped for. The next year, Ryder would return to a more modern look. The writers looked beautiful, sleek, and well put together. Back was the melodrama of years prior, with a bunch of new mysteries. Also, the return of Ryder vs. Ryder fights with Kamen Rider Kabuto. And it also underperformed. For as cool as the suits look, for as high-tech as the weapons seem, Kabuto only just barely sold better than Hibiki, leading to an odd time in the Heisei era where Ryder just could not seem to stick the landing. All right, and we are back to the end slate. I don't really know what I'm supposed to say here. I just know um, I'm supposed to have one. So yeah, uh, subscribe, like the video, all that good stuff. Oh, right, so first video is almost at a thousand views and that is really awesome. Um, that's way more than I expected. I really appreciate all the positive feedback. It means a lot to me. So yeah, like I said at the beginning, this video was sort of just a little personal project to help clear up any misconceptions that are around Hibiki and hopefully I did that. So yeah, look forward to the next video and yeah, thanks for watching. Oh, right. So if you have any video or topic ideas or any of that, just let me know and I'll take a look at it. I am always in the mood to research tokusatsu and help people learn about the medium.